All right, uh, good morning, everyone. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the December Ag Sector Council Seminar, and thank you all for coming today. There was a snow day in Washington, D.C. yesterday, um, as you all know, and uh, there's a lot of good food security events going on this week, so there's a lot of competition for us today, and so we're really happy to have a nice crowd in the room today. Uh, my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And uh, I'm really excited about this event today, showcasing three examples from the Farmer to Farmer program and integrative uh, integration of volunteers. Uh, Farmer to Farmer is a large program and um, has been kind of catching some news lately, and I think it'll be really interesting to see what our three speakers uh, have to show us. Just a first a few housekeeping issues. Please silence your cell phones. Uh, however, if you are a Twitter or social media person, please feel free to keep them out. Or if you're joining us online, uh, you can use the hashtag AgEvents to follow along on Twitter. We do have an online audience joining us today. And uh, we ask the people who are online to please go ahead and share your experiences if you have uh, any link to the Farmer Farmer program or any other uh, agricultural volunteer program. Please share your experiences and your resources in the chat box. I think we will um, have a few clarifying questions after each speaker today, uh, but we ask that you wait and um, hold your questions until I call for them after each speaker. We'll need to pass the microphone to you for any Q&A period so that the online audience uh, can hear your questions and so we can record everything. And we are recording this event today, so if you'd like to review any portion of it or share it with your colleagues after the fact, you can do so. All right. Uh, lastly, before we get started, I just wanted to call your attention to an event that is happening next week, a webinar run by the Spring Project on uh, leveraging community videos for agriculture and nutrition behavior change in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, this will be with Rick and Gandhi of Digital Green, who I, I think many of you have probably encountered or uh, have heard of Digital Green. They're a really fantastic um, organization, and we are also going to be doing a lot of Twitter engagement surrounding this event, uh, a Twitter chat afterwards. So we hope to join um, at 9 a.m. next Tuesday, and that is on AgriLinks. All right, so to give a brief introduction to today's event, I would like to welcome Gary Alex with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, who is the program manager for the Farmer to Farmer Volunteer Program. And uh, I'll pass the microphone over to him. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, and I'll give just a few words of uh, introduction for this uh, session today uh, to introduce and the presentation seminar that presents some highlights of innovative uses of volunteer technical assistance in development programs. USAID has a long history of uh, support for and use of voluntary technical assistance in its programs and development efforts. That goes back to the early 1950s. A USAID predecessor organization, ICA, uh, established uh, mechanisms for uh, voluntary technical assistance to work in development and in agriculture. And that support and emphasis on uh, volunteer programs and support has continued to today. The um, program today, or the benefits of volunteerism are, can be many. One of the first and obvious ones is uh, cost-effective technical assistance. And that's uh, often technical assistance from volunteers that bring an enthusiasm for their work and continuing support and engagement um, with their host organizations and additional resources for the program. Uh, but maybe more importantly, uh, accessing volunteers can bring, um, bring in technical assistance that is um, very practical, uh, that is state of the art, and brings technologies, methods, and practices from the US private sector and other institutions to bear on international programs. And finally, the volunteers uh, with their people-to-people -people exchange and uh, the citizens' diplomacy uh, 
present a real, real American face uh, to our development assistance in line with our, the tagline to our logo of from the American people. Uh, they also help to broaden understanding of international development and development issues. The uh, seminar, or the program today is really oriented towards highlighting innovative uses of volunteers and how they can be very effective. The examples all come from the Farmer to Farmer program, which um, has, uh, has been active for several for about 25 years and provides about 600 uh, volunteer assignments each year uh, around the world. Uh, these assignments are very diverse as, by example, the, the programs being highlighted today. Uh, and they have involved some, in recent years, some 20 different organizations have been involved in implementing these programs and providing the uh, the services we have a selection today of three of these, and um, I will now um, just with a brief word of introduction of these. They're all programs, as I said, that are farmer to farmer uh, programs, but they are all examples of mechanisms that can be. Uh, used by missions or other aid offices to access volunteer services uh, with their their own funding. Um, the first will be Deanne McGrew of Winrock International, uh, which presenting the Partnership for Safe Poultry in Kenya. This was a buy-in uh, project for Kenya in East Africa from global health and mission funding that was used for a two-year program to build capacity in, in the poultry sector responding to avian influenza. The second will be Patrick Nor Norell of CNFA uh, describing the Georgia Access to Mechanization Project, which was um, an associate award funded through an LWA by the Georgia Mission. And Malina Dumas from Vega Volunteers in Economic Growth Alliance will describe a Morocco engaging venture capital to strengthen agricultural value chains project. This was a small grant project uh, which was in this case funded by the core farmer to farmer program but could well have been funded by um, mission buy-in. So with that I'll ask Deanne to uh, take over. I think I'm mic'd. All right. Um, good morning. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, AgLinks, for hosting and having us here. Um, I'm here to talk about the Winrock's Partnership for Safe Poultry Program in Kenya, uh, a completed program, um, and give you a little bit of information about the approach, um, activities, and lessons learned. Um, as Gary mentioned, this was a two, two and a half year program from March 2009 to August 2011. Um, $1.1 million in total funding. Um, initial funding for the program came from the Kenya Mission. Um, there was additional funding provided for some limited regional activities from the East Africa Mission. Um, and uh, then I think a little bit of, of finally maybe $100,000 came from um, the PDP uh, funding. And the program was active in nine districts across Kenya following uh, the bird migration corridor. Um, and looking specifically because that's the way avian influenza would have come into the country. Um, and then were, there were also limited activities um, in the region in Ethiopia, Uganda, and Tanzania. Um, the program utilized 45 total volunteers, both international U.S. volunteers as well as some uh, East African regional volunteers, as well as a limited number of paid consultants and um, $33,000 worth of in-kind grants. Um, that was what, you know, under traditional farmer to farmer, which util usually utilizes only U.S. volunteers, that's how this particular program was unique. It was unique in duration in that it was shorter than a normal farmer to farmer program. It was unique in that it had a very, a very narrowly defined scope. 
Um, and it was also unique in that in addition to U.S. volunteers, uh, it utilized local and regional volunteers, um, some paid consultants, and grants um, to match those activities. Um, the program, basically po poultry is an important economic activity for um, smallholders throughout Africa. And in Kenya alone, 75% of poultry producers, the majority of whom are women, ra raise um, small, free-roaming flocks that are highly susceptible to um, avian influenza. So the program was designed to essentially promote improved biosecurity to reduce the threat of avian influenza, and at the same time increase the competitiveness of Kenyan eggs and poultry meat, and increase income for these um, smallholder producers. Um, the, the approach of the program, as I mentioned, was linking targeted sector stakeholders in Kenya with U.S. and regional volunteers. Um, who provided assistance to increase efficiency, improve production and marketing, um, improve biosecurity, um, and following are a number of activities that volunteers were directly uh, um, engaged in. First, they brought together uh, poultry, uh, sorry, poultry sector analysis first. This included stakeholder inventories, value chain analyses, um, targeted studies on sector competitiveness. This one was an interesting study that was done. This, uh, this competitiveness study showed a growing consumer preference for indigenous poultry as, as opposed to like commercial broiler um, poultry meat. And so there was, uh, there was, it showed that there was an interesting opportunity um, and also a threat, you know, because of the biosecurity concerns. Um, so a lot of these, these analyses led to um, you know, further activities that happen through volunteers throughout the life of the program. Um, the program worked to strengthen local capacity of both government stakeholders as well as producers, associations, et cetera. Um, on the government side, um, volunteers helped facilitate uh, the development of a national poultry improvement plan that was fleshed out by the Ministry of Livestock and then later actually funded by the ministry to promote um, a improvement in the poultry sector. Um, it, they also provided uh, this type of capacity building training for smallholder producers um, on record keeping, marketing, and management practices, developing business plans, developing feed formulations and certifications, um, and developing feed standards. They also worked on um, improved biosecurity practices. These were simple techniques, everything from you know, limiting contact, using a foot bath to prevent contamination, very simple biosecurity practices that were introduced that um, resulted in reducing uh, mortalities from 20% to from 3 to 5%. These are very simple, cost-effective things that poultry producers could um, implement. And uh, we worked with producers to do um, improved biosecurity practices as well as with traders. Um, the program also worked creating uh, linkages to markets, uh, market information, and finance for smallholders. Um, that was doing things like working with them to aggregate inputs um, so that, you know, to give them better access, promoting the development of an innovative financial model that helped producers to really understand what the break-even point was um, and understand you know, what inputs and outputs would be required that also provided a linkage to finance with the banks because the banks could understand how to uh, finance this type of smallholder uh, poultry production. Um, we also um, developed, uh, the program developed a poultry uh, website that was eventually turned over, managed by a committee through the Ministry of Livestock. And this was an open source uh, data, man uh, data management site where it would provide linkages for those in this, uh, in this sector as well as information to stakeholders. Um, let's see. In terms of the regional expansion, I mentioned that the East Africa Mission um, added money to the program for some limited regional activities. 
Um, these regional activities include uh, poultry sector value chain analyses in Ethiopia, Tanzania, and Uganda. Um, and then also there was a regional workshop and tour where we invited sector stakeholders representing all the value chain actors to come from each of the three countries to Kenya to sort of uh, be trained in programs, tools, and practices to do field tours to demo farms and see some of the activities and biosecurity practices in, uh, at work. And finally, a discussion of the value chain findings and the application of the PSPK model in each of their own countries. Um, following were the key accomplishments and impacts of the program. Um, program trained more than 3,000 individuals and uh, benefited more than 12,000 households. Um, also uh, leveraged an additional $1.1 million in investment from both the government of Kenya, the private sector, and donor funding. We were pretty proud of this to have a $1.1 million program, USAID investment, leverage an equal amount of funding from the government and um, private sector in, in Kenya. Um, it increased incomes and diversified diets for food insecure families through poultry production. We had people telling us that you know, they were actually not only raising this for commercial purposes, but eating eggs and poultry meat with their families for the first time. Um, it empowered women as farmers and entrepreneurs, uh, group leaders and business people. 57% um, of the individuals trained were women. Um, I mentioned earlier that 75, you know, there's a very large percentage of maybe 75% of poultry producers are women. But the program itself worked with 57% women because women are mostly producers, not traders. They don't get involved in the processing as much. It's mostly at the produ uh, production level. Um, it also, the program also successfully changed um, both farmers and investors' perceptions of poultry as a profitable business. This was, again, part of the uh, financial model, success of the financial tool that was developed. And um, it demonstrated that you know, people would adopt biosecurity practices when there was an economic incentive to do so. Um, Again, we talked about the National Poultry Improvement Program that was developed in collaboration with the Ministry of Livestock Development. Um, it also, the program increased access to safe poultry products by investing in the development and marketing of these indig indigenous poultry brands. Um, we facilitated stakeholder dialogue um, and contributed to building a body of knowledge uh, on the poultry value chain, both in Kenya and in the East Africa region. Um, supported lasting improvements in the feed industry by uh, assisting the Association of Kenyan Feed Manufacturers to improve feed quality and develop a certification program for feed manufacturers. And this feed was specifically for indigenous poultry. Um, strengthening the capacity of the Kenya Poultry Farmers Association, they more than doubled their uh, support to household members. Um, promoted efforts to produce high quality feeds. Uh, the Great Lakes University of Kisumu is now using these improved feed formulations and has instituted, uh, introduced a new poultry science degree, the first in, in Kenya uh, for this particular sub subject. Finally, um, increased production of safe poultry products um, through, we had worked with 11 demo farms where we had introduced these biosecurity practices and these were, we had farmer field days and brought people from the region, the stakeholders to the, that came to the workshop to see this really promoting um, uh, biosecurity. Um, lessons learned from the program. Um, again, the dual focus on smallholder production and measures to address biosecurity was a way to increase competitiveness and in incomes. We were really showing that there was, uh, people would adopt biosecurity practices um, if there was an economic incentive to do so, as we saw in the program. Um, addressing market and market information increased smallholder interest and their ability to move toward higher volumes of production. Um, this financial model that I talked about was an essential tool for promoting the commercialization um, 
Again, deliberate efforts to target women would have been strengthened. The project, when we worked with the women's groups, we uh, worked with, with already existing groups. So we weren't involved directly in um, group formation. Had we been, we could have almost worked with 100% women. Um, utilizing volunteers, as Gary mentioned, we, you know, this was a, a standard lesson, is that it was a cost-effective and efficient approach for delivering this type of assistance. Um, we also found that uh, it was highly successful to pair U.S. volunteers with local volunteers because not only did it build the capacity of their beneficiaries, but it also built the capacity of the local volunteers to be able to provide continued assistance, promoting that sustainability. Um, the project's focus on this single value chain enabled it to have um, a very, you know, uh, focused effort contributed to the impact of the program, um, and it also allowed us to use more specialized technical experts as field staff. This is, again, a little bit unique for farmer to farmer. A traditional farmer to farmer program is a little bit more um, broadly spread. And so this, such, having such a narrow focus enabled us to also utilize um, high level poultry experts as staff. Um, and finally, the combination of technical assistance and grants enabled us to have a deeper impact. All right, that's all I have. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, now, we'd like for you all to hold your kind of larger, more conceptual questions until the end, but does anyone have a clarifying question uh, for Deanne's portion of the presentation? We've got one back here. We're passing the microphone. Yeah, just real quick. Uh, and please state your name and organization if you wouldn't mind. Uh, Rob Mergenthaler, uh, Office of Food for Peace. Uh, just curious, you mentioned uh, free roaming as a biosecurity risk. So what was the model you were using actually here? Was this the, the American agribusiness model of just housing these chickens in one spot, concentrated in one place? or? Yeah, so basically to limit contamination, they would have to be housed. Um, so it was like small pens or something like that so that you could limit access into and out of the farm. But even if it wasn't like, you know, houses in the traditional sense here, obviously we're not building large-scale, you know, poultry houses, but even just fencing just to limit. Uh, free range but not free roaming, exactly. I guess. Okay, exactly. that's the distinction. So, mm -hmm. yep. so they weren't completely reliant upon the, the feed that you were mentioning as like their sole source of feeding or was this just a supplement? To that feed. No, I think so. You know, originally most smallholders they're just producing, you know, poultry for. Um, it's almost like a savings account, right? And so it's sort of like you're producing chickens so that when your kid you need school fees, you go and sell yeah, a few chickens. Yes, yeah, sure. And so the idea was if they wanted to be able to move to a more commercial production where they could um, produce uh, birds, gr uh, grow them, and then sell them on a regular schedule, like a four-month, six-month schedule, then they would have to use some type of, you know, improved feed. It wouldn't just be, you know, whatever, you know, you're on your own with bugs and, and grass and that sort of thing. The, the paid consultants that you brought out here, where were they coming from? Private sector? Uh, yes. So, uh, we only used a couple of paid consultants. A couple of the paid consultants were uh, national, like, an Ethiopian consultant in Ethiopia to do the value chain analyses, a Ugandan consultant in Uganda to do the analyses. Then we also had a couple private sector consultants, and um, one of the avian influenza experts also was a was a consultant. Okay. Okay. Uh, one more clarifying question. Charles Opaus, USAID. Um, did you do any studies about the income impacts, on-farm in, uh, income uh, benefits to the program? We did um, a, a few case studies. And what we did is we took several of the beneficiaries and we looked at um, what, kind of what kind of impact on their incomes it had had. And then also not just uh, how did it affect their in incomes, but how were they utilizing those incomes. What were they paying for? What were they buying? What were they investing in? So we had, again, with a two -year, small two-year program, we did some case studies to look at what impact it had at that level and how they were utilizing the increased incomes. 
And we found what? We found, of course, that their incomes increased, and these were women, and they were investing in their families, of course. So they were paying, <laughs> paying school fees, making sure the family was eating uh, maybe more, more meat and eggs themselves. Um, maybe taking the money to invest in other businesses, maybe like a sewing business or some other type of economic income generating activity. Thank you. Thank you. And there will be uh, certainly more chance to ask specific questions to Deanne uh, after the other two presentations. So we'll hand it over to Patrick. All right. Uh, thank you all for joining us today, and obviously to USAID and AgriLinks for organizing this. I'll be talking about the Georgia Access to Mechanization Program. I guess uh, the first thing to note uh, about this program, uh, the ways in which it's innovative in the world of farmer to farmer, is that it was not primarily a volunteer technical assistance program. Uh, AMP was a 30-month, $5.1 million program uh, that was intended to develop custom tillage services to serve Georgian smallholders. Custom tillage meaning uh, that, a, that a small farmer that really couldn't afford to buy his own tractor would be able to go to a local private enterprise and contract uh, that enterprise's operator and tractor to come to his field, plow it, plant it, apply fertilizer, provide harvesting services. Uh, it was primarily a matching grants program. Uh, we had a one-to-one -one matching requirement. So for every dollar of USAID funds, we required a dollar from the, uh, from the local partner. Uh, these were quite large grants. Uh, USAID's contribution was, was maxed at $150,000. In practice, the local partners usually exceeded that one-to-one -one match because the local partners were responsible for construction costs. USAID didn't cover that and typically wanted to buy multiple pieces of machinery that weren't covered under the, uh, the that our $150,000 grant wasn't enough to cover. Uh, of course, the goal was to provide more timely, better quality machinery services to smallholders in order to allow them to increase their productivity and increase their incomes. Uh, okay. So again, a 30-month, $5.1 million project it was a cooperative agreement uh, and an associate award, which was funded through, at that time, what was the Farmer to Farmer Europe, Caucasus, and Central Asia Leader Award for Farmer to Farmer. I'd like to mention a little bit about how the program came to be, because uh, I think that's an important element of it. Uh, an associate award uh, uh, through the Farmer to Farmer LWA mechanism is typically uh, an instrument for a mission to buy into the program to facilitate a greater uh, uh, use of volunteers to meet the mission's objectives in that particular country and to help missions solve problems uh, or, or address needs as they arise. It's a very flexible mechanism. Uh, in this case, uh, the USA Georgia mission had a request from the government of Georgia to help facilitate uh, it, the introduction of new machinery and improved access to machinery services for smallholders. So CNFA was able to work directly with the mission to design this program in order to quickly meet a need that they had in responding to the government of Georgia. It began with a concept note that we developed jointly with the mission. That concept paper uh, was submitted by USA Georgia to Farmer to Farmer here in Washington and cleared. And then once cleared, resulted in development of a full proposal for the full three-year program. So a collaborative process all along the way involving both USA Georgia, both the mission in the field, and farmer to farmer here in Washington. Now, of course, farmer to farmer volunteers were a part of it. Uh, and this would not be the most innovative use of volunteers. This is something that farmer to farmer volunteers do all around the world. The most basic use of volunteers was firm level capacity building in business and technical skills for the machinery service centers that were created through the program. Uh, we fielded a total of 25 volunteers over the 30-month life of the project. Uh, the vast majority of their work was dedicated to helping uh, improve financial record keeping, business planning, marketing, uh, helping these machinery service centers actually get out a, a unified brand. They all carried the same logo. They all had the same package of training. They all had the same uniforms. They became a recognized network for delivery of machinery services around the country. So volunteers contributed to the development of a brand identity and a unified mark, uh, mark, marketing plan for these things. 
uh, things like how to set prices, how to calculate costs, how to improve customer service. Uh, and though this is not uh, the most innovative use of volunteers, it was interesting to note in Georgia that this was something that U.S. volunteers were uniquely qualified to do. The custom, essentially retail level, custom machinery service center model was something entirely new in the country. It had never been done before. It was the type of business that didn't exist. At the same time, it was something that American agribusiness professionals knew a lot about. There have been a lot of, uh, of similar businesses like that in the United States. So they knew exactly how to teach their Georgian counterparts to develop and run these businesses. Now, apart from the firm level uh, assistance with machinery service centers, we, uh, volunteers also work to provide agricultural lending training uh, for lending institutions and to work with Ministry of Agriculture employees to improve uh, their training capability and good agricultural practice. The agricultural lending training is particularly of note. Uh, volunteers worked together with our long-term local staff, and we had a, a credit specialist on, on staff who was really working, uh, again, at the firm level and with individual uh, banks to do a matchmaking activity. He was helping to develop business plans for each machinery service center, shop them around to commercial lenders, and try to obtain commercial finance as part of the matching investment that these enterprises had to make in their, uh, in their projects. Uh, but we also use volunteers to work beyond uh, on a broader scale and actually build the capability of several lending institutions to better understand the risks associated with agricultural lending uh, and to design products that are specifically tailored to agricultural borrowers. So we conducted two ag lending workshops, uh, 24 lending personnel from, from seven banks and one micro lending institution participated. And we get good U.S. volunteers from the farm credit system and, uh, and from commercial banks in rural areas. It's, uh, it's something that farmer, to farm, farmer volunteers are particularly effective in supporting. Uh, all of this together, the, uh, the work of our long-term local staff and the support from the U.S. volunteers actually resulted in more than a million dollars in new agricultural loans that were achieved through the program. Then training of trainers for the Ministry of Agriculture. Uh, it's a process that uh, is accelerating now, but at that time it was just at its uh, beginning stages. The Ministry of Agriculture of Georgia was starting to reintroduce an extension service. Uh, so we were able to deploy U.S. volunteers to build the capacity of Ministry of Agriculture extension agents in food safety, good agricultural practices, modern agricultural technologies, and actually to develop training materials for the machinery service centers themselves to provide training services to farmers. So on two fronts, the sort of classic extension services, which are usually a public good operated by ministries of agriculture, and the privately funded, commercially oriented training activities of the machinery service centers with the goal of getting a well-educated client that gets a good result and comes back as a repeat customer year after year. Uh, also important, and another uh, item that U.S. volunteers were particularly effective in providing conservation tillage, uh, including uh, the use of no-till equipment. Uh, which is uh, something uh, quite new for Georgia, and basic uh, elements of soil conservation in, in uh, the performance of machinery services, like don't plow up the hill, uh, which is something they would commonly have furrows running vertically up hills, which when it rains leads to the soil running downhill, uh, a tremendous problem with erosion. Right, as a result of the program, we had 21 machinery service centers finally opened around the country each one an independently owned for-profit business, 194 jobs created through those centers, $377,000 in new wages. To judge the performance of the businesses themselves, again, this was a new business model for Georgia, uh, we had $1.78 million in sales of machinery services to more than 16,000 smallholder farmers, the ultimate intended beneficiaries of this program. And remember, this is just in the 30-month lifespan of the program. Uh, so just why we, what we were able to measure while we were on the ground and implementing. Uh, 2,245 200, farmers received extension trainings. That includes both the trainings provided by the machinery service centers and by the Ministry of Agriculture. And the bottom line, what good did it do for farmers? Uh, farmers surveyed reported an income increase of 68% or $5.3 million as a result of receiving access to timely custom machinery services. Patrick?
Yeah. Yeah. Do we have any clarifying questions for Patrick? Yes, from the same. We'll <coughs> take the gentleman in the sorry. back first. <laughs> That's all right. Rob Mergenthaler, Office of Food for Peace again. Um, the, the equipment you're, that you were selling to the farmers, I'm very interested to know where those were yeah. from because I would think that, you know, in this, particularly in this region, it would, I mean, the most likely source would be the Belarus uh, tractors. Yes. yes. Well, a uh, couple of things to mention on that. Uh, one of our requirements for the program was that any equipment purchased had to be provided by a local dealer, by a manufacturer that had an official dealer who was able to provi provide parts and service after the sale. Uh, so there were some brands that were eliminated from consideration just because of their lack of a local dealer. Of those that did have a local dealer, for sure the go-to, the first uh, response for most of these uh, entrepreneurs were the Belarus tractors because they were the uh, tractors they knew. Uh, but we organized this process by which all of the local dealers were able to market their products to the farmers, uh, to the entrepreneurs, the machinery service center owners. And in fact, the, so the choices made by the machinery service center owners turned out to be pretty diverse. Uh, we had a good selection of Kloss machinery, which is relatively high-end German manufactured machinery, a, a pretty good amount of Case New Holland, which although it's one of our beloved American brands, it's actually owned by Fiat now and, uh, and manufactured in Turkey. Uh, probably the most, the largest number of tractors were Chinese-made photon tractors. Uh, and it was a conscious decision. People knew that they were probably giving up something in quality and reliability in exchange to get more tractors that they, they in the short term could use to earn more money. We've got a question from online. Uh, this one's from John Russell of, oops, sorry, I lost your, Eco Food Systems in Oregon. Um, are the centers typically owned by individuals or cooperatives? We did not have any that were owned by cooperatives, although that would be a perfectly suitable business model. It just happens in the Georgian context that uh, in the first place, there's kind of a post-Soviet resistance to cooperation. Uh, and in the second place, there is not uh, until this year, actually, maybe six weeks ago, a cooperative law in place that treats cooperatives as nonprofit entities. A cooperative under Georgian law suffers, has suffered in the past from double taxation, where it pays profit tax just as any uh, for-profit company, and then the members are taxed again on their, on their dividends as they're distributed. So it has not been a viable business model. In this case, they were all private enterprises, though not all individuals. Some of them were, uh, were uh, limited liability companies. Some of them joint stock companies. Larry Paulson, uh, you said retired. Which farming operations best or most lent themselves to custom operations, and which one didn't? And were there surprises on either end? Uh, I wouldn't say surprises. I think the results we saw were pretty predictable. I, I'll, I will mention one real surprise that we had. Um, the, the, we knew that our core uh, grant recipients for this, our target market for establishing these centers, would be those that were already involved in input supply. And CNFA, through a, a previous program funded by the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation in Georgia, had established a network of retail input supply businesses selling seeds, plant protection products, fertilizer. Uh, so adding on a custom machinery service component to their activities was relatively easy. And, and those were the core of our grantees. They performed as we expected. Uh, what was interesting about this program was the very large uh, dollar value involved in each project. So if we're giving $150,000 grants and we require a one-to-one -one match and we say we're not going to pay for any construction or salaries, which drives the, the local recipients match up, that drove us into some different kinds of applicants that, uh, that we hadn't worked with before, Th those kinds of companies that had that much money to invest in a project like this. We were extremely wary of getting uh, applicants without agricultural experience, without serv any kind of uh, service provision experience. But I would say one of our most successful farm service centers was a bunch of young guys, 25, 26 years old, with an entrepreneurial spirit, with an understanding of what customer service was about, and with money to invest that really threw themselves into this and made this their, their main business from scratch. That was a pleasant surprise. We thought we were taking a big risk with that. That's what uh, development programs sometimes are for. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Charles Afas uh, again, you said. Um, small farmer is a term that's 
thrown around a lot, of course, here. Um, who is your target population? When you talk about small farmers in the Georgia context, who are we talking about? In the Georgian context, the average land holding after privatization per household, per rural household, is 1.6 hectares. Uh, there has been some consolidation. Um, all these countries of the former Soviet Union are kind of at different stages in that consolidation process. But still, uh, and, and there's also been some depopulation of the countryside. There are enormous uh, number of Georgians working overseas, as is common. Uh, so as a result of that, you'd see families grouping their land holdings together. Still, uh, the main clients for uh, this program are uh, talking about aggregate land holdings of five hectares or less. Uh, we have, I think, oh. um, the, uh, Yes, the, the microphones are more so for our recording purposes and aren't linked into the room. So it may feel a bit strange to be speaking into them, but um, they help the, uh, the uh, online audience hear all of your questions. I got it. All right, uh, Dick Tensley, Colorado State University. I'm actually here to visit my grandkids, <laughs> but enjoying the seminar. Okay, first of all, um, as a one who's a career with smallholder agriculture, I can't emphasize the importance of mechanization in trying to get the drudgery out of the system. I could go on and on for that. But also I'd like to reiterate the comment coming online from the person in Oregon as to the fact that mechanization has got to be absolutely private. The use of um, government or public sector mechanization units and maybe even cooperative, and you mentioned that, mechanization was discredited approximately 40 years ago, could never keep up with the maintenance or t subject to a tremendous amount of, shall we say, buckshees gratuity operations in which uh, people paid a little extra and got priority on it, not getting to the smallholder farmers they were intended to. And typically of the 10,000 service hours on a, on a public sector ownership, you get maybe 3,000, maybe 4,000 and the thing would be sidetracked. So I'm going to just say be very careful about how you keep that and try to keep this very, very much on the private sector, preferably individual ownership. Thank you. Do you have any response? Or I just would mention that I, I agree completely. I think that's quite true. And I, I mentioned during the presentation that this program came about as a response to a request from the government of Georgia. We were not, USAID was not the only uh, entity to respond. The Japanese government also responded to this request from, from the government of Georgia and funded a quite large program uh, that, that put a much larger number of tractors, 200 tractors, into a state-operated, government-owned machinery service entity. So we were a little bit worried as we were starting off the implementation of this program that we'd be competing alongside a, a state-owned behemoth. Uh, each one of these being, each one of ours being individual, small, separately owned businesses three, five tractors each against this 200 tractor nationwide government owned uh, operation. As it turned out, it, it wasn't an issue. The, obviously, the government owned uh, company couldn't be responsive enough in, in service time to get the tractors where they were needed. They weren't competitive on price uh, because the, the bureaucracy and oversight was, was slightly mismanaged. Uh, our centers uh, profited and flourished and actually uh, demonstrated their their improved flexibility, better quality of service, and improved financial performance in the face of the state-owned. Uh, not now they're trying to privatize it. At this stage, they're trying to privatize the state-owned machinery service. Center. I think we have one uh, quick clarifying question online, and then we'll move ahead. But we can certainly uh, come back sure. to questions for you after afterwards. Uh, yes, this is related to a question that you sort of already answered, and it comes from Oliver Ferguson at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. How, do, how did you target the specific skills that you needed from volunteers? Uh, so we designed a training package, more or less uniform training package, for the uh, Machinery Service Center owners and staff. Uh, as I have mentioned, CNFA has done a lot of input supply programs that are very similar to this in a lot of countries around the world. And the small business management skills for operating a retail service providing or input supply business we understand pretty well what they are. Uh, we also have an already standardized training curriculum. So it was, uh, we knew clearly that uh, in working directly with the machinery service centers, we would be looking for US volunteers that had small business management skills, 
that understood ba basic financial record keeping, that, that uh, knew marketing, especially at the retail level. And luckily, those, that, those types of volunteers are ones that Farmer to Farmer uh, doesn't have much trouble recruiting from the American public. Um, they were rel that was relatively an easy task for us to, to figure out which kind, kinds of volunteers we wanted and, and to recruit them. All right, thank you, Patrick. And we'll move along to uh, Melina Dumas. OK, thank you. Good morning, everyone. I wanted to start by just thanking USAID and AgriLinks for the invitation to, for Vega to present our project at this panel today. As you can see, the title is Engaging Venture Capital to Strengthen Agricultural Value Chains in Morocco. And the main purpose of this short-term one-year pilot project was to prove the hypothesis that there's strong demand for American industry expertise in Morocco and that this kind of technical assistance can really help scale the impact of venture financing in the country and beyond. Um, so what I'd like to do today is give a brief overview of Vega and this pilot project, more of the design and the preliminary results since this project just ended last month. Um, so Vega is actually a member-owned organization. We're a consortium of 23 members that you can see on the screen. Um, and all of our members work in economic development and integrate volunteers into their activities. Um, you've heard about the LWA, Leader with Associate Award, mechanism today. And Vega was actually created by USAID 10 years ago in February as a Leader with Associate Award to gain access to these member organizations. And we've grown in our membership over the past 10 years. But as Gary mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, Vega was also awarded the Special Program Support Project for Farmer to Farmer this year. And Vega is a nonprofit organization in its own right. So before we became the holders of the, of the SPSP, we were actually given a small grant by Weidemann Associates, the previous holder of this award. So this was made possible by USAID through Weidemann Associates. And for this project, uh, part of the innovative model is to, to bring new farmer to farmer implementers to work in this area. So for this project, we opened up the possibility to all of our non-implementing farmer to farmer members to participate. And the organizations that participated in the one-year pilot were CUSO International, the MBAs Without Borders program through Pixera Global, which is formerly CDC Development Solutions, and the International Executive Service Corps, IESC. But the real cornerstone of this pilot is Vega's new partnership with the Venture Capital Association in Morocco. Uh, the acronym is AMIC, uh, taken from the French. Um, and uh, this partnership was facilitated by Vega's program advisor, William Fellows, who's based in Casablanca. He's a former venture investor, and he's been working in North Africa in economic development for over 10 years. He's really the go-to person for venture capital information projects, partnerships in North Africa. And for anyone who's going to the Farmer to Farmer Implementers meeting in Marrakesh in January, you might get a chance to meet William Fellows and learn more about this project from him, as he was really the instigator and the designer of this program. So I'd like to talk a little bit about our partnership with the venture capital firms which worked very well in this one-year pilot. These VC firms in Amik have been identifying and investing in high potential innovative agribusinesses for years. The association was created in 2000. They have about 20 members and 13 associated firms. But they face major constraints in their investments of these agribusinesses. One is the management structure and a lack of human resources in the agribusinesses themselves. And often, the investment officer who's placed by the venture capital firm to work with the agribusinesses uh, lacks industry expertise. They're usually former bankers or accountants who don't have the industry expertise for the particular agribusiness that they're working with, any, any kind of in food industry experience generally. And so they're very receptive to outside technical expertise and voluntary assistance from new partners. And so the VC firms for, for Vega, they gauge the demand and the, of agribusinesses in their portfolios and screened the applications for technical assistance. They then put together the scope of work, submitted it to Vega, which was then cleared through Weidemann Associates. And we were able to recruit and send volunteers that matched the expertise that they required. Um, and once the volunteers arrived in Morocco, the venture capital firms also covered all of their in-country expenses, such as lodging and transportation. And they provided some oversight of the logistics of the assignment, which was very helpful. And that worked well. So we received a, a mix of requests for assistance from both startups and mid-growth firms. And we actually received more interest than we were able to fill in just a one-year pilot project. Um, and given the success of the project, we've also continued to receive subsequent requests. Um, 
And once, um, okay, so that's actually all for that. Um, on this slide, I, I put just a few highlights of the impact of volunteer assignments that I, I won't go over in detail. But I did want to mention that, as with the, the other presenters from, from Farmer to Farmer, typically the, the experts that Vega accesses are high-level senior experts, often retirees, who have very specific skill sets in, in targeted industries. Um, but one thing that was innovative about this particular pilot project is that we also partnered with our member organization that I mentioned, Pixar Global, now that used to be CDC Development Solutions, with the MBAs Without Borders program. And this was a, a very successful new partnership in which we were able to place a longer-term volunteer. Uh, for this pilot, it was just two months, but the MBAs Without Borders program typically places recent MBA graduates with several years of work experience in developing countries for six months to a year or, or longer. So we would have liked to have extended this assignment, but it, was, it came to fruition towards the, the end of the pilot project. But it received very uh, strong satisfa satisfaction from the host organization, from the investment officer with Moroccan Invest in this particular case. And so that uh, recent MBA grad was able to actually sit within the company for two full months working full time, able to conduct more in-depth market research, really see the strengths and weaknesses of the organization on a variety of, of levels. One of the highlights I put up on, on the screen is developing a customer relations management system for the organization, but she also covered a, a lot of different areas. And they, and they asked, their one complaint was that they wished that they could have had her for longer. Um, and as you can see in the picture, we also had a former senior vice president of McCormick Spice. His name is Harold Hal Handley. And uh, he works with our member organization, IESC. And he had very relevant expertise working with saffron producers in Agadir, Morocco, and with some other beneficiaries as well. And just kind of to emphasize the citizen diplomacy aspect and, and the value of volunteers, once he came back to the US, he continued to engage with these companies via email and connected them to his brother, who's a patent lawyer and could help with some other issues that they were facing. So we see a lot of value with, with, with these kinds of volunteers. Another one of our volunteers was on his ninth farmer to farmer assignment. So this was his first time working directly with Vega and with some of the other members. But he's worked in the former Soviet Union and other countries, typically with firms that are not as far along as the one he was working with in Morocco, which is a mid-growth firm around since the 1970s that even exports to the US and Subway as one of the consumers. But they had a lot of issues that he was able to help them with to help further scale their production and their environmental considerations. Um, so I'm going to finish on this slide talking about some of the lessons learned from the project. Uh, given that this is a one-year pilot and it was one of the first projects that Vega more directly implemented, we had a lot to learn and we have a lot to learn from our farmer-to-farmer -farmer implementing partners. But we did see that there's a strong demand for American expertise in particular in Morocco. Uh, it's relatively easy for these firms to access European expertise, sometimes volunteers from Europe and sometimes uh, these kinds of consultants can be very expensive. And we wondered in the beginning if the, if the American expertise would really add value. And then after going to Morocco in October and meeting with the beneficiaries and hearing about their experiences and the, the demand that this actually spurred, we can see that American expertise is, is desired. And this kind of goes to a point further along that I, I won't go over later, that there are misconceptions about um, US versus EU market regulations. And the Moroccans tend to think that it's impossible to enter the US, that it's much more difficult. But really, it's just a lack of understanding and even an introductory conversation with one of these volunteers who comes to understand their company's position and, and their products, they see that there are major opportunities as well as challenges that they wouldn't have considered. And so that really helps them moving forward. Um, as I mentioned previously, there's a desire for either longer term assignments um, or for a repeat assignments. So to have a, a short term assignment, a, a senior level expert go out and then six months or 12 months later go back to the country and follow up with the beneficiaries to ensure that their recommendations are properly implemented. <laughs> OK, should I wait? Or? OK, sorry about that. Um, hopefully you heard my last point. Um, the next one is that in the design process, Vega didn't really take into consideration the impact of seasonality on these activities. One year is a very short period of time to implement a project. And we were dealing with a, a variety of different agribusinesses that work with different crops, have different harvest times. 
And so it was a little bit difficult to match up when we were able to recruit the specific technical, technical expertise when the volunteer would be available, and then keeping in mind that around harvest times it was impossible to send the volunteers because the entire management would, would be out of the office and not able to conduct oversight of these assignments. Um, one thing that's fairly interesting is the Moroccan government's focus on agriculture. There's an initiative called Green Morocco that's pumping millions of dollars into the agriculture sector from the government. And in light of the Arab Spring, these kinds of initiatives are very important and much talked about in the country as a way of, of keeping it stable. Um, and many of our beneficiaries, if not all, have received free land from the government or other kinds of resources that have made it possible to start new ventures that wouldn't, they wouldn't have even thought of otherwise. Um, but these also do come with more regulations. And one example of how this impacted our project is that a volunteer was able to go into the country and completely redesign a prune production facility that was in the planning stages. Um, and this completely saved the project because of the commodity that they were going to use to fuel the system tripled in price in the past year. And they would have actually had to scrap the idea. And the volunteer was also able to make the facility 30% more energy efficient. But since the design was complete, uh, completely redone, they had to resubmit these plans to the Moroccan government, and that pushed off their construction date for about six months. And again, when we went back in October, they were requesting follow-on assistance for the same volunteer or another volunteer through another program to come back and help oversee the actual construction and the implementation of his recommendations. Um, going back to another point, we, we didn't include translation in the, in the budget for this project, but it was difficult to find French-speaking technical experts from the US and in order to really be able to hit the ground running, um, it would have helped to have an interpreter available to help read the documents that are in French or help facilitate some conversations with people who didn't speak English in the country. Um, and then just to, to conclude my presentation, I did want to mention that we had a, a meeting with two of the project volunteers uh, uh, here in DC with Gary and, uh, and others at Vega's office. And they mentioned that they would really like to have the opportunity to follow up on their work. And with a one-year pilot project, it's not necessarily possible given the resources. But it's very important for the volunteers to see that their recommendations are implemented. They're interested in going back or just having email communication to help uh, provide follow-on assistance to ensure that, that their work is, is um, really sees results. Um, and they also asked to have more information about the companies before they went to the field. Since I mentioned the venture capital firms were actually putting together the scopes of work, and they were typically very brief in just a few sentences about the kind of expertise they were looking for. Um, but the volunteers want to prepare sub several weeks in advance. They'd like to read up on the company's current capacity as much as possible so that, again, they can really make the most of one or two weeks in, in the country if they're on a short-term assignment. So to conclude, I, we, we at Vega do feel that this project validated the premise that our American technical assistance can help scale and sustain the impact of venture financing in agribusinesses in Morocco. And we hope to be able to build on this partnership that we've created with Amik, with either current partners or future partners, to leverage their resources and follow up on this increased demand from Moroccan, from Moroccan agribusinesses and venture capital firms. Um, so if you would like more information about the project, um, you can contact me at the email address on your screen. And I'd be really happy to hear from anyone. And I'm also available to answer questions today. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Melina. Um, well, in a moment, I'll ask all three of our presenters to come up to the front for further discussion. Uh, but first, are there any questions specifically for Melina and um, about Vega's experience? Gary. Uh, you might say how much the budget was for the project. The budget was approximately $93,000 for a one-year pilot. And we ended up extending for two months in order to meet some of the demand that came towards the end of the project. Uh, any other specific questions? Melina? All right, well, you'll still have the chance. Um, but I know there may be more general questions about Farmer to Farmer or for all three speakers. And um, so if you all wouldn't mind coming up to the front, we've got these four very knowledgeable individuals. This is your chance to grill them on any aspect of, uh, of their project. And so I'll come over here. Um, and please uh, remember to state your name and organization when asking a question. Uh, Chris Goldthwaite with Cantera Partners. And I had a question for Patrick. 
You mentioned uh, mobilizing loans from local banks uh, in support of the uh, uh, enterprises. I'm wondering if the level of local interest rates was an issue or a problem at all. Absolutely. <laughs> in, in short, yes. Uh, I believe at that time, Georgia has a little bit more liberalized system. They can make loans in, uh, in foreign currency, which is not always the case. So I believe on uh, Georgian Lottie loans, uh, it was somewhere around 24 25% annual interest. On US dollar loans, somewhere around 10 or 12% interest. It, it's certainly a constraint, but it's, it's better than in some places. So. Charles, I'll pause again, you said. Um, uh, speaking from, ex from uh, considerable field experience, uh, an issue with farmer to farmer has always been how to make it strategic, how to, to make sure that the volunteers that we get can have a, a, a real multiplier, a strategic effect on the agricultural system in the country. It looks like in the case certainly of Georgia and the poultry in East Africa, you've been successful in doing that. Uh, but I wondered if you had any, would, uh, Morocco, although I served there years ago, I don't know the situation there as well. I know there's no longer any uh, you say agricultural program of any of any uh, size there, but I wonder if you'd care to uh, to contact that uh, to to comment on that and how you managed to achieve this. What looks to have been a pretty good strategic fit with uh, the ongoing USAID program. So, uh, um, sure. So so speaking to our experience in Morocco, you're right that there's not really a focus on agriculture anymore, and our program advisor William Fellows really. Uh, sees this as um, a negative for, for Morocco. Agriculture is a major, majorly important sector in Morocco. A lot of people um, conduct farming activities. And it, it, like I said, the Moroccan government is putting a lot of money into this. And But it's actually, we really like this new partnership because it's even better to have the venture capital firms really pointing out which agribusinesses are going to be able to raise up industry standards. They're creating a win-win by um, showing that it pays to play by the rules. And by combining development technical assistance with this venture financing, instead of having um, a development organization deciding which businesses to assist on its own and kind of targeting specific regions for, uh, for, for purposes other than perhaps the impact that these agribusinesses can potentially have on the broader economic climate, um, this is actually a, a great model for follow-up on USAID's activities in this country in the past. So again, we're hoping that we can continue this collaboration with the Venture Capital Association with more venture capital firms and, and create more impact by really targeting agribusinesses that have the most potential for impact on smallholder farmers, on the, the standards of these industries as a whole. Um, and we're, we're welcome to collaboration with, with other organizations in this area as well. And from our program advisor, I'll also mention that it's not, it's not just in Morocco that this can really have a major effect. We're looking at other countries in North Africa and on the African continent and in other countries as well. It's, it seems to be a good model for targeting better the, the technical assistance that, that can be provided from the United States citizen volunteers. Does that answer your question? Um, I can comment on that. Uh, in that question is for the the general or the core farmer to farmer program that it is an ongoing issue uh, and also every one of the six or seven hundred volunteer assignments a year are somewhat unique in the circumstances so uh, it varies but the program in general has moved in the last couple of years uh, to addressing that and achieving broader impact from volunteer work through uh, probably two strategies. One is to work with a partner organization in country, which might be a, an extension service or an agribusiness uh, association or uh, some entity that will help disseminate the results and the, the recommendations from volunteer services. Uh, so that's one mechanism using that somewhat leaves some um, remaining impact or recommendations that are, are more broadly disseminated. And the other is simply uh, there's increasingly uh, programs are 
are scheduling volunteers to present uh, public um, presentations, often at universities or in other relevant fora of, of their experiences and, and findings in the country. Uh, we have a question from our online audience. Yes, this question comes from Kristen Malaidza from University of Tsukuba in Japan. Transfer of technologies or innovations from developed countries to developing countries is usually not straightforward. How does Farmer to Farmer ensure that volunteers modify their technical assistance to suit the target beneficiaries and ensure sustainability? You want to start? Sure. <laughs> That's an excellent point, uh, and one of the biggest challenges in implementing farmer to farmer. Uh, it's something that the farmer to farmer implementer staff, and particularly local staff in the field, have to constantly uh, battle with uh, to explain to the volunteer who has come from, you know, uh, a, an environment in uh, U.S. agriculture that benefits from modern technology and a lot more capital and. Uh, to explain to that volunteer that they can't simply recreate the environment that they're used to operating in in the United States in the developing country. So guiding the volunteers to be able to recommend uh, low-cost, highly uh, rep replicable, low-tech uh, uh, improvements that can have an immediate uh, impact on, on productivity and on incomes. Often uh, one of the pieces of advice that we give volunteers is to think back to the way their fathers or grandfathers uh, conducted their uh, agricultural production and that many of those simple approaches are suitable to, to driving real improvements in the developing world today. We also do a lot, I think, to mitigate that um, beforehand with, uh, you know, detailed scopes of work. I mean, we were talking earlier about, you know, really trying to get a statement of the problem, but also looking at a host profile and providing some details to the volunteers in advance to explain to them um, the level of the business or the cooperative or whatever that they're working with, sort of um, to give them a better picture of um, the status of, of this organization and what type of technologies they're going to need to bring to bear to, to be able to make this successful. Um, fortunately, with technology, we're able to oftentimes put the volunteer, the identified volunteer, in contact with the host organization or at least with our field staff in advance to work out a lot of these issues. They're tossing ideas around, saying, well, would this work? What about this? You know, what about this technology? Do they have access to this? Um, so sometimes we're able to um, hash out some of those details in advance of the assignment to try to mitigate that. And then another thing that I think has been um, pretty successful is across the board, it's like bringing so the volunteer goes out with this advance information, um, completes the assignment, and then at the end of the assignment when they're getting ready to make full recommendations, we work really hard with the volunteer, the beneficiaries, and the field staff to make sure that the, uh, the recommendations are um, adopted, you know, that everybody is in agreement that these are ways to move forward. And if there is any kind of disagreement with the recommendation, then we try to address that at that time to try to make some kind of adjustments to those recommendations. Do we have any other questions, either in person or online? Pass this back to you. Uh, Fred Smith with Insight Systems Corporation. Um, the origins of the program were really focused on the exchange value of volunteerism and, and the farmer to farmer programs. And over the years, they've been challenged, as uh, example from some of the questions you've been getting about how you fit in strategically. But I wanted to ask about the exchange aspects of the program and how you measure and monitor those and how you're able to uh, continue to uh, improve the value of those exchanges. Well, the measuring and the monitoring is very difficult, as you know. Um, I mean, obviously, we promote. I mean, we, we strongly promote the value of the person-to-person -person exchanges. And I think, you know, the farmer-to-farmer -farmer program at large, we're trying collectively uh, trying to promote outreach, engaging uh, volunteers to, to do um, other types of outreach 
both in the country as well as back at home to promote those types of exchanges. But measuring it, I don't think we've, we've figured out a, a, su a successful way to do that yet. Gary? Thoughts on the measurement? <laughs> no, it's a very difficult thing to measure. We have um, we tr monitor the outreach activities, especially back in the U.S. The press releases, the uh, the presentations that vol return volunteers give to at their local Rotary Club or university department or whatever for their they're in, uh, and these are very substantial numbers. There, there's a lot of local publicity generated and a lot of exchange of the experience. Uh, anecdotally, it's almost all positive. That's what people are talking about. Uh, but to capture how many people that reaches and the extent of increase in understanding of foreign assistance and international issues, development, that's, that's a tough one. And uh, we, we don't have a mechanism to do that. Uh, there's other equally important outreach in the local countries that we work in, and that Farmer to Farmer is in. Uh, and that varies. Uh, quite often, there, there's a good bit of um, press generated on stories of volunteer assignments. There's uh, the the presentations that volunteers do that I've, I've mentioned. So uh, there's a, a good bit of outreach there publicizing U.S. programs and USAID development efforts. One one example I'd note on the people to people, the citizen diplomacy aspect of the program, which really it really is difficult to to measure, but I think Belarus is an interesting case. We don't have a very good relationship with Belarus, obviously. Uh, the Belarusian government is extremely suspicious of international uh, and particularly Western European and American organizations. However, we have been implementing the Farmer to Farmer program in Belarus for, gosh, I don't even know, eight years or so at least, maybe more. Um, and CNFA through the Farmer to Farmer program is the only Western organization registered with the government of Belarus. Uh, and the reason for that has been taking a little bit of extra effort to have US volunteers make presentations to university students, uh, to conduct trainings for government of Belarus extension or Ministry of Agriculture extension personnel. And gradually over time, uh, the powers that be in Belarus have seen that the program is not a threat. We're just helping farmers grow more and earn more money. Uh, and they've come into contact with ordinary Americans who don't have anything but the best intentions for Belarus and, and the Belarusian people. Uh, and I, I think it's been uh, effective in that sense. It's a, it's a living example of, uh, of citizen dip diplomacy being effective. All right. I think we have an online question. Yes, this question comes from Muhammad Barrow. Um, uh, and it's for all of the presenters. Is child malnutrition a part of your concerns for any of your programming, in addition to some of the economic issues that you guys have addressed? Um, well, I can start and say no. For, for Vega's small pilot project, that, that would not have been in the scope. We were pretty targeted in, in um, working with the venture capital firm's requests that were directed to Vega, so not, not for this program. It has not been in the past. However, with the advent of Feed the Future and the need to uh, coordinate farmer to farmer with uh, with other mission-funded uh, development programs, I, I think it's uh, a new activity that we'll see for farmer to farmer volunteers. Uh, nutritional outcomes are not uh, directly related to the indicators that we report to to USAID on uh, for farmer to farmer, but I think we, it would be quite possible for us to recruit nutrition volunteers and to support other Feed the Future programs. Thanks. Quick question for Deanne. Uh, my name is Elliot Masters with Apt Associates. Mm -hmm. Having not um, noticed Myanmar in the table which was shown there, and first of all, congratulations on a wonderful project. Thank you. My, my quick question is whether or not WinRAC has considered bringing such an approach to Myanmar and elsewhere within Southeast Asia? 
Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, also, there was there was similar uh, research done um, by Winrock's uh, JDR uh, JD Rockefeller III scholars um, in in Southeast Asia. Similar research on poultry competitiveness, avian influenza, that sort of thing. Absolutely, we're very interested. Um, we've considered it. We marketed it. One of the challenges right now that we're facing, and this was this was true as the program was ending, even in Kenya. Um, Poultry is not typically one of the feed the future focus um, areas. And even in Kenya, everybody was really excited about the program. They were really happy with the results. Nobody had any money to fund it <laughs> because all of the money was tied to other um, cereal crops or large scale livestock or something like that. So absolutely, um, we are absolutely interested in looking at that for Myanmar would be a perfect example. Um, but it's just a matter of getting, um, you know, getting agreement between government stakeholders, USAID, and everybody on the same page. <laughs> Thanks. All right, do we have any other burning questions? Or it looks like we have one more from online. This one is from John Russell of EcoFood Systems in Oregon. Um, and again, to everybody, is there typically ongoing contact after their in-country assignments are over between farmer-to-farmer -farmer volunteers and the enterprises they help? Yes. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. A resounding yes. Yes. <laughs> it goes back to the measurement. You know, we were talking about we, you know, we don't have good measures to show how many, what percentage are in contact, that sort of thing. But we know. Um, from, um, you know, anecdotally that most volunteers do remain in contact and it's really amazing and impressive sometimes the things that happen after the assignment. Sometimes the biggest impact happens long after the assignment is complete because these relationships have, have been established. All right, one more from in person. Uh, yeah, Aaron, Aaron Days, USAID, Farmer to Farmer. Just to, to comment on that and, and relate that back to the, uh, the question about measuring the people-to-people the -people impacts. I think this is really one of the major impacts and the differences between working with volunteers as opposed to consultants. It's that long-term that long-term follow-up and those those long-term relationships that are formed. And again, the, the measurement, as, she, as Deanne said, is the, the big challenge there. But anecdotally, from following up with these with these volunteers and with the host organizations as well over time, we see that so many of these, the volunteers develop long-term relationships and that consulting relationship goes on for, for years and years. You know, the, the impacts happen a lot of times after the project has already ended. Thank you for your comment. Um, I think we are winding up a bit on the questions. I wasn't sure if any of you had any final thoughts you'd like to throw out there. Um, if you're not jumping at that, then um, I think we will uh, go ahead and wrap up. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. We have evaluations on all of the seats, and there should also be an evaluation link online. And we always appreciate if you let us know that you've come um, and give us suggestions for how we can improve next time. Of course, uh, we invite you to continue the conversation with AgriLinks. Uh, you're welcome to uh, get in touch with us with the emails that are on the board there, or reach out to the presenters with further questions, further networking. Um, and we really, really appreciate your participation. We'll see you again in January, I hope. So thank you all for coming.